Hey, it's Gary Holt from Exodus, and you are listening to Thomas Gavel, the podcast of PowerMetal.de. Hey, everybody. It's Marcel from Thomas Gavel, the podcast of Power Metal E. And this following episode is in English because of our today's special guest. He was born in Richmond, California, one of the main characters of the Bay Area thrash metal scene. And for me, one of the inventors of the thrash metal as we know it today. And in this year, his band is celebrating his 40th two birthday. And he's part on the band till 40 years. Oh, and... Yeah. We will talk about thrash metal, we will talk about the mighty Exodus, and we will talk with Gary Holt. So, Gary, welcome to Pommes Garde. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel right now? I feel great. You know, yeah, when you put the, the band's uh, length of existence into terms like that, I feel a little old, though. <laughs> Four <laughs> decades I've been in this band. So it's it's amazing. Crazy. Before we will talk about the upcoming records, for me, a very cool record, I think. Um, can you give me a little update about Tom's health status? How does he feel right now? Tom's doing amazing. I mean, we just played uh, our first show together since his uh, cancer battle, um, and he cool. destroyed it. It was super awesome, emotional night. And, and he's doing killer. He's relearning, you know, in a, you know, a new relationship with food, you know, because he doesn't have a stomach, but... So he has to eat differently and uh, approach food in a whole new way that you and I don't have to. But, you know, he's adjusting. He's doing super well. I talk to him all the time and uh, he's, you know, playing the drums and ready to get back. So, Gary, during your Slayer engagement, um, which ended in November 2019, did Tom and the other Exodus guys still work on the material for the new record Persona Non Grata? No, we... Um, didn't really get serious until july when tom and i gathered up in the mountains to start working on stuff i'd been writing for a while and um sending tom riffs and songs and stuff and uh then we got got up to this place in the mountains and we uh gathered and just him a set of drums me and a half stack and uh started putting it together and uh, it was super fun and super easy did you have any ideas for the new exodus songs while you were on the farewell tour with slayer Yeah, I'm constantly recording riffs and writing down ideas and song titles and things of that sort. And, uh, you know, just I have a huge list of stuff, you know, to this day, you know, you know, song titles, especially mm -hmm. if, you know, a subject or a title appeals to me. You know, I put it in a little note in my phone and keep it, you know, and then I remove it from the note if I use it. So, you know, I have a, a little catalog of things to lean on when it's time to start working. Do you want to to hear my opinion about Persona Non Grata? Of course. For, for me, it's an absolute killer record because it's uh, quite better than um, Blood In, Blood Out. And um, for me, it combines all the great and mighty Exodus trademarks. Um, the material did not sound like a continuation um, of Blood In, Blood Out, rather a lot uh, of records put together. And I think... It has this wonderful bonded by blood, nostalgic, uh, in combination with the force of Tempo of the Damned and the modern thrash power of Blood In, Blood Out. So um, I think you were very focused on these things Exodus stands for. Yeah, we were super focused doing this album. You know, we had no distractions. You know, it's where COVID helped us out because, you know, uh, we didn't lose any summer tours because we were going to make an album, you know, like it, everybody else had everything being canceled. Mm -hmm. What we didn't have was offers coming in, you know, for tours and you end up taking them. All right. You know, we got we need to go out and earn some money. Let's go take this offer and stop recording and we'll come back to it. We just worked. And it was just Tom, myself, guitars, drums and a barbecue grill and a lot of beer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know and it was like it was like summer camp. You know, it was like a vacation. And uh, we'd get up and have breakfast and coffee and we'd just go out and start riffing out. And um And we, you know, Tom and I speak, a, you know, an unspoken language. You know, we've been playing music together for almost our whole lives. And on uh, this album, we really put it all together. It wasn't any intentional thing we did. We just uh, just worked really hard and we kind of listened to our gut instincts. And uh, and I think this album does cover all the eras of Exodus all in one. I mean, there's a little force of habit in this record. You know, there's... Yes, yes, little, of course. 
impact is imminent. There's flashes of the flesh. There's bonded by blood. Um, but all modern and all a, a new take on all of it. But just it's super full. This album covers everything, and it sounds insanely killer. If I have to rank my favorite Exodus records, it's uh, on the first place, uh, Temple of the Dent, because it was my first experience with Exodus and it blows me away. And then Bonne Bablat, of course. And then it's very good uh, Persona Non Grata, um, because, like I said, it combines all the thrash metal um, trademarks and Exodus trademarks. And um, was this focus um, the main aim which you started the work on this record? When it all comes down to it, we just we didn't like sit there and say the album had to be like anything. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to write great songs. That was it. You know, we wanted to be heavy, of course. And uh, but we wanted like we wanted choruses, you know, and this album, every song is just a hook after hook. You mm -hmm. know, we wanted to like have great songmanship in the context of a super heavy thrash album. And uh, that was the only thing we, we considered, like, let's make sure it's good. So what do you think would Persona Non Grata sound different if there wasn't a coronavirus? Or uh, did the COVID-19 situation have any influences on the sound or aggression on Persona Non Grata? It certainly did lyrically, even in a subtle way, because uh, when we were writing this album, you know, sometimes, you know, you're working on stuff or you're sitting around the house, you know, up in the mountains and um, you're seeing on the television in the background, you know, The world is like basically burning, you know, like everything that could go wrong is going wrong. And uh, so you're kind of absorbing this from, you know, without even realizing it. And it's just creeping into your subject matter of your songs. And um, and next thing you know, you know, people are telling me the album covers like, you know, all these societal ills. And I didn't even really realize it. You know, it's just writing, you know, I'd get up in the morning and write, you know. I was very surprised about the title, uh, Persona Non Grata, and I think it has different uh, types of meanings. Is this your personal side card for the divided society, for all the people who fight against each other instead of building a mankind union? I guess you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, let the song, um, I let the song mean whatever it means. You know, like uh, I get asked every interview I do, who is Persona Non Grata to me, or who is in the song, and I'm like, it's no one person it's like it's negative energy is my persona non grata mm -hmm. you know but to you it could be an ex-wife an ex-husband a boss a politician uh a former friend it could be anybody mm -hmm. you know you fill in the blanks you know the song means to you what you say and and, and gives you a bad feeling and um yeah, this exactly. not worth for yeah and it, it's just a waste of energy to like uh to spend your energy on such things. Absolutely. So what do you think are the reasons for this split inside the society? Politicians, the media, they they, they all want to separate it, uh, you know, because there's strength in numbers. And the last thing they want is a unified America, you know, at least in my own country. I can remember a time when politicians at least pretended to appeal to the other side mm -hmm. for their votes as well. You know, a, a Democrat may like, try to sound tough on law and order to try to like gain some votes and the other people seem like they want to like help out the poor, you know, that's only during election time, you know, now no one even cares anymore. I just want my voters and I do not even give a fuck about the other ones, you know, and, uh, and it's led to a completely div divided society where people will hate each other over difference of political opinions, you know, like, I've had different differing opinions from most of my band for my whole life and we're still brothers, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the whole world could learn from Exodus. <laughs> you know, like we're said. brothers in arms and we're Democrats <laughs> and Republicans and we still get together and hang out and drink beer. Well, when I was drinking barbecue and make albums and hang out and laugh together, you know, we don't hate each other. I like mean, in the I, summer camp. Yeah. I mean, some bands today, I don't think could even exist that way. It's like you all have to believe the same shit or you can't be in a band anymore. And uh, when you are on tour with Death Angel and Testament, was it like a summer camp with old friends? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons we chose to postpone it. 
because, uh, you know, for one, the risk of canceled tours right now is huge. Every tour that's in America, you s- almost every one you're seeing like, you know, five shows canceled, blah, blah, blah. And when you lose five shows for us, Testament Death Angel, you're losing every- all the profit, all yes. the money. And next thing you know, you owe money and you come home and you're, you're in debt. It's better to not be in debt. I'd rather just not make money than owe money. But also... Yeah. You know, um, we want to like be able to tour the way we did in Europe. We want to have fun and hang out with each other every day because it's fun. You know, we don't want to have to tour and live in a little bubble. And I see Chuck Billy or Mark Osagueda and I got to <laughs> put my mask on and walk by him real quick and talk to him from 10 feet away. We want to like have fun. You know, I'm, I'm too old to do this and have it be miserable. And it was so good to see you on stage with Exodus. <laughs> I, I had the best time of my life. It was wonderful. Um, a little question about uh, the, the title, Persona Non Grata. Um, I think that the title, The Beatings Will Continue Until Morale Improves, is very representative uh, for the message of Persona Non Grata, for me especially. Um, so do you think that the living will be easier if everybody everybody's morale will improves? Yeah, obviously, if our morale is better, we'll like, live better. But, you know, I... I was watching all the rioting and stuff and uh, the riot cops just beating people with sticks, you know, a lot of peaceful protesters being beaten. And it just made me think, and, you know, it's a slogan. I've seen it before, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves. And uh, it just made me think of that slogan uh, when I was watching that in the background, you know, like, what do they hope to achieve? Do they like if you beat enough people, they'll like submit and become compliant and uh submissive you know like that's not the way human kind works you know um we fight back and it just it seems so counterproductive to me so you know the song was written kind of tongue-in-cheek you know based on what i i felt they were i guess hoping to achieve it didn't work it never does you know you can't beat people into submission not anymore And I think the most people treating you bad uh, in course, they will feeling self better because they are very upset or, or uh, depressed about their own lives. And so they, they will treat you bad that, uh, in, in course of, of their bad lives. Yeah, I mean, you know, the writing was all due to like, you know, yes. the Black Lives Matter movement because they were protesting being killed for nothing, you know, and like, And it's horrible shit, you know, that they have to go through. And like, I'm one of those guys who I'm a big supporter of law enforcement, but I also understand that being a cop doesn't give you a a right to like drag a guy out of a car and kill him for a traffic stop. You know, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're killing a guy, it's supposed to be done to protect your own life or the, the well-being of the general population, you know, not because the guy was on, didn't want to get out of his car. You know, you're not supposed to put your knee on his neck and fucking kill him. You know, so, the, you know, that that was the angle I took it from it, you know, it was based on the protests. A very horrific um, story, I think. I was very upset that, uh, to, to, to listen that this is possible in this society right now. And um, I was very shocked. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, you know, like there's a whole lot of good cops in this world and there's a lot of cops in the United yeah. States and they're not all bad. And all of a sudden people want to like defund the police department. So like, who are you going to call when someone's stealing your car? <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you need some police sometimes. But uh, <laughs> our police need to do a better job, some of them, of like, you know, how they handle situations with like the use of force. Absolutely. I want to tell you one of my favorite songs on Persona Non Grata. It's called Clickbait. And um, it was, for me, a fantastic appetizer for the whole record. Is this English song your personal criticism of consumer behavior? Criticism of the media, you know. Of the media. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, how they, you know, they, everybody's, everything's monetized. And, you know, so they have to, like, lure you in and they have to bait, like, the trap to get you to click because they get paid for how many clicks they get. Mm-hmm. And, you know, heavy metal, like, media is, like, super the most irresponsible. <laughs> they're terrible at that shit. You know, they're like, they'll take an article where someone praises a band as the greatest band ever, but then in that, praise they say the one album they did they don't like it and the headline will say so and so says he doesn't like Metallica <laughs> or Slayer when the whole article said you know no they're the greatest band of all time I just don't like this one album I think it sucks and then it says Gary Holt says so and so sucks 
or anybody else, you know, and, um, but, you know, in politics, it's, it's run rampant. It's horrific. You know, anytime Joe Biden like stumbles on a word, which I stumble on words all the time and mm-hmm. I'm not senile. It's like, you know, Joe Biden is like, you know, losing his faculties, you know, or, you know, even Donald Trump. Right. And I, you know, I couldn't stand the dude. Everybody knows I can't stand the dude. The guy would like make a typo and it turn into like, you know, two days of news, you know, like I typo all the time when I type on my phone because I'm not very good at it. You know, I can imagine he's probably not as good at it as I am. It's all part of the dis- device of nature of everything. Absolutely. Um, I'm just like the sound of the title. It sounded good. Like, like, you know? <laughs> oh, I think I think it's very good. Um, but you have to answer me one question. Um, what does REMF stands for? Rear echelon motherfucker. <laughs> Grateful. Because um, it's a very pissed off song. And um, I think um, this is representing Zitro, your singer, as a so great main man for the voice of Exodus. Uh, he sounds unbelievable powerful on this record. Um, what do you think? What are the reasons for, for this development since Blood In, Blood Out from your point of view? Well, when we were doing the vocals with Zetro for Blood In, Blood Out, I was in Europe with Slayer. So everything had to be done via email, mm. phone conversations. You have the time difference. And then he'd redo a vocal part and send it via Dropbox and And then I'd have to listen to it. Then I'd give suggestions again. And so that's really difficult, you know, to mm-hmm. like work that way without being in the same room anymore. And uh, this album, you know, Zetro came up and stayed with us the whole time up there. And he was part of the summer camp. And uh, we had a, a small demo studio set up in the rental house. And so I would go drive down the hill and go over there and I'd record some vocal phrasings. And then he could actually work on them. And then we started trying different stuff because we had all this time and ability and uh, we felt no pressure and no no time constraints. And uh, he just killed it. He's so good on this album. It's yes. amazing. So do you think it's the better way to record a record? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like if you look in the glory days of hard rock, Queen, Deep Purple, they used to like take off. And they'd rent like a an estate somewhere. They'd go to Lake Geneva and they'd like make an album. They'd bring the whole studio. Right. Mm-hmm. The Rolling Stones did that. A lot of bands did that. And that's how we record. Exodus was like, we're like the, the cheap ghetto version of Queen and Deep Purple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they have Lake, Al- Lake Geneva. We have Lake Almanor. But, you know, it's the same thing. Bunch of guys isolated together in some place that's pretty and beautiful to look at and making music together. In the end, I want to mention two more songs um, from the new record, which I like very much. Um, for example, Prescribing Horror. And I think it's had, it has a very cool Slayer vibe in the song. A little bit of South of Heaven, I think. So for you, how important was your part of Slayer for you as a songwriter for Exodus? I, I don't know. I, I never really thought that song uh, sounded Slayer-ish. I always thought it sounded like similar to like something maybe trouble would write you know mm-hmm. super like doomy you know for exodus it's a straight doom song you yes know? just a little chunky or you know a little more palm mutes you know um the song was almost not used and it's my favorite song i had mm-hmm. demoed the whole thing in garage band and we kind of like were near the end of the recording tom and i like we started listening to some unfinished stuff i had and like what well, this song's got real promise mm-hmm. you can't ignore this And so we threw all my garage band tracks into Pro Tools and then we edited the song while sitting there listening how we wanted it and then we recorded it. And oh. uh, we actually kept some of the guitars, the clean guitar and the, the little haunting melody part are from my laptop off the demo. You know, I just felt re recording them would take away the vibe, you know? Mm, okay. And um, I want to mention my personal hero on this record is The Years of Death and Dying, because I think it has a very cool power metal vibe in this thrash metal. So we are on powermetal.de, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So what do you think about my mention of power metal in Exodus? Well, I mean, when we got around to the chorus of that song, uh, like uh, when Lee Altus showed up to the mountains and uh, I started playing him the songs, And we got to the chorus on that, which was a little different, but the melody was there. Um, he goes, what in the name of In Flames? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, there's a little Swedish influence on that, I think. And, uh, you know, 
that was written entirely while up in the mountains and tom wrote the lyrics to that mm -hmm. based on some poems that he was working on and uh you know it's one of my favorite songs but you know i can't pick a favorite on this album they're all super good you know exactly so um i will i wish uh we will we will see you on tour um in... <laughs> we, can, we also can't wait one last question um as we speak about the bay area theme bands like exodus but are uh, also testament death angel heathen possessed uh were part of the legendary bay area thrash metal history but what do you think about the us thrash metal scene at this moment and which bands um will take up this legacy sometimes what do you think well i mean there's some great bands i mean municipal waste already are ah, achieving great legendary status and you know power trip you know certainly were primed to do it before riley passed and mm -hmm. i'm sure when the time is right you know my brothers and power trip are going to come back strong uh you know they need time to grieve obviously such a tragic loss and you know warbringer killer band there's great bands in europe like lost society are great. super killer and uh you know the 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 new generation is there and they're strong and they're killer and um you know at every exodus show the audience is getting younger you know so it's kind of cool to stand on stage and see a lot of like teenagers it's amazing i love it so no worries about the future of thrash metal no nah, it's it's going strong Wonderful. So, Gary, my friend, uh, with a quick look on the clock, um, I have no more open-ended questions right now. Uh, instead of one last question, what is your most favorite song at this moment? Your most favorite rock or metal song or pop song? <laughs> my favorite album in the world right now is the latest album by Haim, Women in Music Part 3. And uh, the song Up From a Dream is just amazing. It's so good. Cool. We put it on this on this theme. And so, Gary, Thank you very much for part of the Pommes Gabel history. Um, it was a big honor for me to speak with you. And dear listeners outside, Gary and I wish you all the best and have a nice day. Right on. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>